Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me. You're most welcome. And a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. It's that sort of time of the year as we speak, as I film this. So, today, something we haven't had for quite a long time, another Wing Nut Wings kit that we haven't seen before. Now, um, when I first saw this, I, I thought, haven't I done this one before? But of course I haven't, because I did the Brandenburg, Hansa Brandenburg, 130 second scan, W29 was the one I did, which is the one that's the monoplane, uh, which was actually from the very later part of the war, uh, First World War, that is, um, around 1918. And this came in at about 1617. So this is the, the biplane, the earlier variant. Obviously they perfected it and made lots of changes and strengthened it up and went to a monoplane with just the lower wing. So it's curious, and of course it's got this um, this Benz Daimler, um, basically what looks like a car engine, they even refer to it as a car engine. You've got the uh, radiator at the front, I'll just zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about here, on the box art. You've got a radiator right at the front, very much like you do with the car, and then this vertical inline uh, multi-cylinder engine here, which I think is six cylinders? Or is it 12? I forget now. A minute, let's just check that because my mind's gone. W12, dum 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 dum. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Doesn't actually say on the side, does it? Anyway, we'll get into that one now. And once we actually look at the cylinder, I think it's a six-cylinder engine. Um, and obviously, uh, it looks like it's come straight out of the front of the car, and has then been planted into this this uh, seaplane for the German Navy in the First World War, and it was quite effective. It was too. Now, I should say at the beginning for those of you that think, oh, wing nut wings, you know. Oh. They're not there anymore. What is it teasing us with these? Well, I think I should do this one because we, we did miss it actually and I overlooked it completely. Uh, and it sort of uh, rights are wrong, if you will. Also, of course, with a Wing Nut Wings kit, unless we find something really dramatic inside this box like a short shot or horrible sprue or warp sprues, like you might find in a Ming World War I airplane kit, you know the one I mean. Uh, unless we find that, then I'm afraid that the certainty of the outcome of this. It's a bit like watching the Titanic movie or something of, of a similar nature. You know, you know that the boat will sink at the end. You know this will get 10 out of 10 because there is really nothing to think of in these kits that, that ever lets them down. That, that was the problem there. Well, it's not a problem. The problem now they've gone. Um, they're just that good uh, in presentation. The box, the, the sprues, the decals, everything, instructions, beautiful. So we know where we're going with this, so just, just bear with me and come along for the ride, if you'd be so kind, and see what you think. Let's have a look at the box. So on the side we've got a little bit of a blurb, which I'll read you actually, because it's not that long. Uh, Ernst Heinkel designed the Hansa Brandenburg W12 Camel, with a K, seaplane. It was built as a long-range two-seater fighter and went on to become one of the most successful seaplanes operated by the German Navy in the First World War. This extremely sturdy triangulated float strut arrangement, that's the way obviously that it has its floats assembled underneath, um, ensured great strength whilst doing away with the need for any rigging wires, which is good isn't it for the modeler as well. <laughs> um, yes I hadn't I hadn't pointed that out. There's only rigging wires at the end just to, like in an X to support the final strut. Apart from that nothing. Perfect yeah. <laughs> So I don't like rigging, I can tell you. I've had a go at it once. Mm, no. Anyway, it goes on to say, first delivered in July 17, so it's only, you know, less than 18 months before the end of World War One. <coughs> Various problems were, in, were ensured that the W12 was not considered fully satisfactory until August, so obviously a, a month of R&D and ironing out glitches and problems. The early production Hansa Brandenburg W12 as depicted in this kit set, powered by 150 brake horsepower Benz BZ3 engine with a vertical car type radiator in front of the engine, as I mentioned, and were usually armed with a single IMG 08 Spandau for the pilot and a Parabellum LMG 14 uh, for the observer behind. A small number were fitted with two IMG 08 Spandaus for the pilot. Okay, I think this has got a single one. Um, late production W12 feature lengthened fuselage, ailerons are added to the bottom wings as well, okay, and to replace the W12 the Camel continued to serve right up until the armistice in November 1918 
A version was built in the Netherlands post-war as the Van Berkel WA and remained in service until 1933. How about that? And we have on the side, I'll zoom you in, we have on the side uh, several different uh, iterations as you can see. Get the zoom to come in nice and quickly. There we go. So we've got uh, one that was based at Zeebrugge, and of course these are always based on the coast uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, Zeebrugge, uh, December 17, we've got late 17 to early 18. Then we've got one here um, based at Silt, and Norderney in July 18, and then Zeebrugge again in February 18 here. Sorry, not getting that quite in the image. So, why don't we have a look? So we've seen, as I say, we've seen the monoplane uh, single wing version. Let's see the original traditional version that came first. And it, it does look less weird, I have to say, with the twin tails, because it's got this very unusual, we talked about this stepped up fuselage that steps up at the back, which is quite a aerodynamically driven design, I think. Um, a bit confusing this artwork, because it does show a Felix tail behind. A bit like the Julis kit set that I reviewed about a year ago, but anyway, it's a lot of the side of the box. Nice box as ever, always nice, aren't they? Now, of course, this is not owned by me, and even if it were, quite frankly, I wouldn't be opening the bags. So we don't need to, because their bags are so crystal clear to see straight through them. Uh, bear in mind, these are now worth about two pounds a throw, you know. So let us have a look at what we've got. It might tempt one or two of you to go out and buy one. Feeling very flush. Uh, in one of my previous, uh, after one of my previous reviews, one of you went, uh, I think it may have been the Sockless Triplane, one of you went out and bought one of those, which is great um, because obviously they're not going to go down in value ever. <laughs> but they, it was quite pricey, I know, um, so you can't pick these up cheaply anymore. And it makes me laugh a bit when we talked about, I did allude to this Meng abomination, the uh, DR1 triplane. It's not. It's not a terrible kit, but it's not anything like the quality that Wing and Wings produced. Uh, and the frustration, I think, for a lot of us that have had that kit, and I'm not going to go over old ground, but it's just the fact that it costs the same, about seventy pounds. It costs the same as what Wing and Wings kit, Wings kits cost when they came out. They were seventy pounds. So it's not like uh, Meng produced it any cheaper to you, the customer, than Wing and Wings would have been. If you'd have bought Wing and Wings, you know. One of their Fokkers or the early, any of the other fighter planes at about £70. So. so you would have expected it to have been a similar quality and it wasn't. So we have got here, and sad, sad I can't open for you, but we've got the lozenge style decals for the wings. So let's just uh, bring you in for this, see if we can get a nice close up. There we go. So we've got this lovely lozenge style. Uh, so the whole of the wing, uh, top and bottom, uh, and it is the top wing we're talking about, I think. I think it's the top wing and the underside of the bottom wing. I may be pretty wrong, I'm just going to double check that because we're checking. Uh, I think I'm right there. This lozenge style. Um, no, I think I'm wrong actually in some respects. I think it's, a, it's obviously the lozenge goes on the top. Yeah. Okay, so the lozenge goes on the top wing, and then it goes on the top of the bottom wing. So when seen from above, it's camoed. That's the idea. So yeah, that, that does make sense if you think about it, because the camo underneath is much, you know, more of a sort of a paley grey colour to blend in with the sky. So the top of both sets of wings would have this on. You can see it's got cut out here for the ailerons. You've got some photo etch over here. And as, as ever, there's not much of it with the wing that wings, they don't go crazy on the back And also, as ever, if I can get it in, come back a bit. It's the Spandau machine gun uh, cooling uh, outer jacket that you see in the main there. That's that's most of the photo hatch. And then a couple of the, the buckles, seat belts and things. And a little bit of uh, control lines for, I think, for... Uh, the aileron control and your gun sights right there. I don't know if you can see that. They're nice, aren't they? Gun sights, yeah. Very nice, very nice. And on the other side, we have our traditional decals, and we got a set of both types of German crosses, the Saxon style or Christian style, if you like, fluted crosses, and then the more traditional, plainer, later uh, straight crosses, and. 
various card numbers, quite a few uh, stencils actually in fairness as well. Uh, and Wing Up Wings decals are very good so uh, yeah I say they're very good and it's because they're made by Cartograph, that's where my thumb is it says printed by Cartograph, Wing Up Wings, there we go. So you're not going to have any trouble with those for sure. Right so that's that sorted. We will now have a look at the instructions. So if you just bear with me for one second. I'm going to promise today to try not to spend too much time repackaging boxes, which I've been told off about. Uh, rightly so, rightly so. Okay, so, won't read all the blurb on the front because we've, we've covered some of it already. Um, does give you uh, just a bit more detail really about the the background, the photographic evidence they've gone to. Um, yeah, and he makes this comment about these uh, lozenge uh, camera I've just talked about, saying that the grey, uh, they were painted light grey on the underside of the fabric wings, but on the top they had these um, lozenge camo, uh, which was clear doped linen finish. Um, and it said the struts were painted with black bitumous tar based paint for protection from salt water and sea. Wow, so they were thinking about corrosion, quite, quite clever. It said um, the tail plane and the tops of the wings are painted with hexagons of grey brown, grey blue and grey violet lozenge style. Um, Camouflage printed fabric does not appear to have been used on the W12 thing that came a bit later on. Anyway, let's have a look inside. So, typical wing nut wings, we have got your sprue tree mapper, so to speak. Uh, quite a few parts here that are purpled out because you're not going to use those. Um, and, and again, wing nut wings, they always have this beautiful, quite simple sprues. They don't overcrowd the sprues, they don't make them hugely big because they want to use their boxes. And then you can see here we've got perhaps a bit of a bit of more of a clue for you about the, the decals and the, the lozenge decals that we just spoke of about the camo. So you can see it there. Um, interestingly, on the top surfaces it's a little bit lighter, almost like a fading effect. And then on the surfaces that are not on the top, uh, by and large it seems to be a bit darker. Same pattern, same colours, just a bit more... Uh, pronounced shall we say and here we go wingnut wings these beautiful photographs that they include this is what makes their building experience so special and it says here early production w12s prepared to launch in late 1918 possibly at list westerland on the island of silt uh, which i think is the, it's northern germany isn't it on the coast on the left we can see 1402 and 1401 uh, and it says here the post June 1918 they converted to thin arm Balkan Krauts, that's the, the German cross, uh, remained, yes, yeah, so it's got the thicker Balkan Krauts and not the Saxon type that we just talked about in these photos anyway. But all the three in the photos have got the standard straight crosses, Balkan Krauts. Kreutz, Balkan Kreutz, I think is the correct pronunciation. Um, and it says it's got the fat arm style. Um, of Balkan Krauts we just spoke of and the floats and float struts appear to be finished in the black bitumen finish uh, tar based paint to protect them as we spoke of. Anyway getting into the build. Um, a bit. Here we go so I'll zoom in a little tad more here we go. So straight away they, they have this thing where they include all these lovely photographs as you can see. Uh, and it's saying, uh, unidentified and unnamed production, Hansen Brandenburg W12, one of the very images which show the window between the observer and the pilot's cockpit, little window. Ah, that's amazing, isn't it, really? So, uh, what is the idea of that? Is that to give him a better view? It's actually a window in the actual bulkhead between the two of them, as you can see there. Which is quite, quite remarkable, really, isn't it? That's uh, something I don't... Don't recall on the other one. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you can see it here. So here's where the uh, and there's a window um, for the observer down in the floor as well, so you can look down. Wow. Okay. Then you get a lovely pilot seat. You've got a camera here for the observer to use when he's taking pictures of the trenches. Storage cases uh, for various equipment to do with the photography gear, which is actually uh, stored inside. 
and you know, there's a photo here of the handheld camera gives you even clues about the colourings of them. Amazing. You've got the back, uh, on the back side you've got this, uh, behind your seat you've got the spare ammunition, the parabellum. Uh, and then you've got hand air pumps for pressurising the fuel tank, hand throttle. Uh, and you basically build it up your sides of your, your cockpit here and putting in your seat. I have to say that the pilot's seat looks like a a nice chair from a gentleman's club whereas the seat the poor observer has to sit on is very rudimentary. It looks like the sort of seat that you get um, emergency seat, fold down seat you get in an airliner <laughs> modern airliner that just slides out. The photo here showing three of them approaching the mole at Zeebrugge in late 1918, the mole being the jetty. Yeah. Um, not to be confused with the one at Dunkirk, which is famous, of course, in the Dunkirk movie and, and the evacuation. Right, so here we go. Uh, we've got the steering wheel, and it really does look like a steering wheel in this case, doesn't it? I have to say that it just looks like a car wheel, really. <laughs> uh, from the sort of 1930s style, really. <laughs> later and then you've got rudder pedals going in you've got um, a, a lovely painting interior guide here which shows you pretty much how those colours should appear and that's very helpful and then you've got internal rigging guide and ooh, here we go <laughs> but it's very helpful to see exactly what, where they go um, wing and wings again don't leave anything to doubt they don't expect you to assume things or guess anything I um, should just zoom out and have a quick word on this because it's something that's been bugging me all year. Many manufacturers, especially ones in the Far East, have the vaguest instructions, even ICM. Uh, I made one of two of their kits this year. Um, they're, they're good kits, very good kits. But they do leave a lot of things vague about the exact positioning and how they should be uh, fitted together and how they should look after fitting. Wing nut wings don't leave you in that doubt at all. Everything is illustrated really clearly, concisely and in colour and in some cases with a, basically um, a 3D image stroke photograph as well. So you just don't get instructions better than this. So I'm afraid many other manufacturers have got a long long way to go to match things. So on this side you've got your instrument panel coming up here. Um, you can see that we've got the, uh, the magneto instrument board as they call it. Uh, which goes in in front of the, uh, the steering wheel and then obviously you've got your uh, positioning of the uh, uh, sort of fairing that goes around ultimately goes around the engine right in front there as you can see so it's got a cut out for the engine shape um, span down machine gun uh, machine gun uh, ammunition case here magazine and the lap belt typical German lap belt featured here Absolutely fantastic, and that of course is in photo etch in the kit. Then we get onto the engine, which is kind of what we've seen in the, a lot of the other ones actually. So um, yeah, I was right; it was six cylinders, as I thought it was. Um, and memory slipped me, but uh, the uh, the Benz BZ3, 150 horsepower, six cylinder inline engine uh, with these great pull rods, push rods, I should say. Um, yeah, it just looks like it's out of a big car, really, or a boat even, <laughs> and, and put into an aircraft. Um, but some great illustrations showing you exactly what they look like. Both sides, photographs there. And some taken from a distance uh, showing it with its, its sump. Um, and you can see damage in this case, damage to the front end of the engine. Uh, looks like you can actually see the conrods look. Uh, it's ripped the, the, the end of the engine gone completely. So you can actually see quite a bit of detail there. Then over in here we've got the, uh, the sides of the fuselage being prepared, uh, all sorts of uh, one or two holes need to be drilled. And then here we've got some nice photo, another nice photo here, and it says that the uh, early production W12 on the mole at Zeebrugge in late 17 or early 18, from left to right we can see unidentified, but possibly one of four aircraft, is suspended in the air, and they all feature the original Eisenkrauts. So Eisenkrauts, as in the first cross, basically is what it means, or earlier cross. This is the, the more Norman style cross, the floated cross. And it said uh, two of these aircraft will be amongst the aircraft destroyed in a bombing raid on the 10th of May 1918. That will be by the Brits, I guess. 
Okay, then we've got the fuselage details, and we're putting in this uh, vertical radiator, which of course is so very car-like, as you can see. It says here, radiator detail from an early W12, as seen on page 8. Then we've got the pilot's door, and his seat, which is visible through the door. That's a great photo, if I'm honest, that one. That's not, not the clearest of photos I've ever seen on the Wing Up Wings kit. Uh, and then we've got the Spandau, uh, and there's an image of the uh, starboard side Spandau. And is there a Spandau on both sides? And they give you options, of course, here. They've got the standard Spandau, or here they have the more skeletal, basic uh, Spandau, whereby you build up using the photo etch to have your cooling jacket on the outside, which looks much more detailed, far, far nicer. And it said, we recommend leaving the engine cowl off. Sorry, I should just say, the Spandau really is, it's a starboard side, it's right on the side, it's not on the top, it's right, right hanging on the side there. Next to the engine. Firing through the prop still, of course. Um, and it says, leave the engine uh, cowling off to display your engine with better detail. Okay, fair enough. That yeah, looks really good, doesn't it? And then we've got fuselage details here, and it shows the machine gun port. And here we've got the... Um, Sorry, the, not machine gun port, the port side. So this has actually got the option for having them on both sides. Clearly see it on the port side here. And again, you're building up the Spandau and using the high detail version with the, the sort of mesh um, cooling jacket on the outside from the photo etch as mentioned. And then we've got various things. We've got pilot's window. So they've got a window for the pilot to look down and a window for the observer to look down. Amazing. Uh, horizontal tailplane. The horizontal tailplane is a very sort of rudimentary looking thing, isn't it? And you've got this unusual rudder, which is like a, a sort of keel stroke rudder of a ship, which hangs down underneath, which is again very unusual. Uh, very unusual setup in terms of the aerodynamics, but of course it doesn't really matter for, for your rudder whether it's uh, above or below the actual centre line of the fuselage. Um, and I guess that they felt that perhaps that, I suspect that that gave them a bit less drag having it in this configuration. Apply naval hex camouflage. Not just clear coated surfaces. Apply the naval hex camouflage decal over the gloss painted. Not just the clear coated surface. Okay. And on the other side we're now getting into the wing construction. And here we can see actually putting the wings in. The elevators are very unusual aren't they? They're almost quite bird-like here and here. It's like, uh, uh, slightly uh, like an afterthought in the way that they are executed. Uh, I find that a little bit odd. Unusual certainly. Even for World War One. And it's got here apply the naval hex decals over gloss painted not just clear coated. So uh, the point they're actually trying to make here again is that it must be a glossy, a very smooth surface for it to for it to bond. So just a clear coat is no good. It has to be glossy, it has to be smooth the surface for them to, to really bond on. Wing struts going in, and of course this is what they're talking about, the struts mean that there's hardly any rigging at all. Uh, and again it's telling you to put your hex camouflage on there. Shows the fuel line here. And now it's looking like a proper biplane. Then you're building up your floats, and there's a photo here showing the floats, uh, which are coated with the black bitumous tar base paint, again for protection from salt water, so the seawater doesn't rot, rot them. And here are these very, um, uh, very strong strut design, obviously, which makes it not needing to have all this rigging, as I mentioned at the beginning. So the struts are quite a strong, rigid style. And then we've got the observer's armament. So we're now getting into the LMG-14 Parabellum. And obviously you've got two options there again, where you can have a simple one or a more detailed, high detail version using the Photo Etch cooling jacket. Uh, and it's got the OIG gun sight that goes on there. And of course, 250 round magazine, and that's, that's the real thing depicted there. Then we're putting our ailerons on, starboard and port. 
plus the control horns. And then we've got this very strange design of exhaust which just basically sticks up. Very simple rudimentary exhaust system. Nothing very aerodynamic about this, it just sticks up and then points backwards over the, the top wing. And there's also a trestle for the rear fuselage which you're going to build up here. So obviously because it's this very high tail system it needs a trestle when it's on the ground on its little wheels or dollies, beach dollies as they call them. Uh, and you've got trestles for the float at the front as well. So they've got everything included haven't they? Uh, a propeller too which of course will be beautiful I know they always are. Um, it says here homing pigeons and bombs are loaded onto a W12 in 19, sorry number 3, 1399 in February 18. Although no bomb racks have been have been fitted to the W12, relatively small bombs such as these could be hand operated by the observer. If you look at it, he's got like a it's got like a handle. It almost looks like he's just bring you. Looks like he's handling a bucket. That's the bomb. Amazing, huh? So those are going to go in, and then we go to the next page. We're coming out to landscape formats. So I can get it all on. Some really nice images here. A um, bit of rigging, obviously, just on the end. A little bit underneath. There's just two lines, and there's just two lines on each wing. We've got a lovely photo here. You can see this most uh, clearly illustrates the very unusual rudder design with this. You know, a keel style ship type rudder. And it says here, one from the initial production of 10 aircraft featuring anomalous details. The upper surfaces of the wings do not appear to have received their hexagon camouflage yet uh, because they seem to be quite translucent in the photograph. Oh, yes, you can see that. Zoom in. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Yeah, you can see it's a little bit see-through on the wing. The aluminium engine cowling appears to be unpainted also. Fuselage Eisenkrauts Kreutz, has a thin white square painted around it and the original application of the serial numbers appears to be painted out and reapplied lower down the fuselage. Okay, yes. Interesting. Whilst the rudder Eisenkrauts appears to have the square white feel. The bottom wing crosses do not. The bottom wing do not. Square white field. Oh yeah, okay. So it has the square, the white square around it and they haven't bothered to do that on the wing is what they're saying. Okay, and then we get into the painting. So, here we go. This is the one at Zeebrugger in December 17. Um, gives you all the guides you need in terms of colours. Clearly see the underside versus the top side there. And again some great photographs here. Picture here of one being lifted onto the mole at Zeebrugge and it goes on to say uh, these guys are part of a patrol led by Friedrich Christensen and Bernhard Vladgia. I think you got that right. Apologies if I didn't. When they were attacked and destroyed the Royal Navy airship. Oh now then, I think this deserves a zoom in. Here we go, Royal Navy airship in the distance here. Uh, attacked and destroyed the C-27 Royal Navy Air airship crew of J.F. Dixon, H. Fail, J. Collett, J. E. Martin and E.R. White who were all killed and dear. Uh, W-12 1184 was destroyed in a bombing raid on Zeebrugge on the 10th of May so this is when they mentioned about several of these things being destroyed later by the Brits knocking them out. Which you can't really blame them for. Obviously oh, so they were doing a bit of damage there. And we've got a really good shot here. A photo of a different angle. And it seems to have a different appearance of the fuselage. The patchy finish of the fuselage is particularly noteworthy. Dark edges on the floats. Dark edges, okay. Um, no doubt an attempt to waterproof these notoriously leaky items. On the 15th of Feb 1918, Urban and Aircar were involved in the action which saw the Curtis H-12B flying boat, uh, which was the Felix Stowe, I think I'm right in saying that, um, which appears to have been credited to them as well as Friedrich, Friedrich Christensen. Hansa Brandenburg W-12 was destroyed along with several of the stuff machines during the bombing raid on the 10th of May 18. Okay, uh, and if you want to see more on this incident that's mentioned here, 
uh, you can. Um, if you go in my back catalogue in the channel, you can see the Hans Brandenburg W29 versus the Felix Stowe, and I think that's the same. I think that's the same. It can't be the same. I'm talking rubbish. I do apologise. This must be a similar incident, but a separate one because they're talking about a Curtis bow here, and this, of course, is the W12, and the other one was the W29. So it's a similar thing, but it's worth checking out that video because it shows some amazing photographs taken by the German crew shooting up this British flying boat um, and shooting up, shooting them up in the water, uh, and it being on fire. Very dramatic pictures, and most of the crew survived and did get back to, to Britain. Actually, definitely worth seeing though because the they include such good action photos, it's remarkable, really, it's remarkable. Anyway, I mustn't get my events mixed up. Um, W12 from 19, uh, 1395, this was from the production order for 20 of them. Again, it's at the Mole at Zeebrugge, another angle on it, and same from both sides. View from the starboard side here. Note the distinctive windscreen, oh yes, look at this. Sorry, I've zoomed you back out. That is useless. Let's go in closer. Let's have a look. I think closer still would not be a bad thing, especially to pick up this windscreen they're talking about. Can you see it here? They've got this very unique windscreen just ahead of the pilot. <laughs> very interesting. And it says, um, also, the floats appear much darker than shown. Uh, note how the change of lighting makes it look much darker. Obviously, the sun is on the opposite side, that's why. Tell about the shadows, can't you? <coughs> then over here, we've got another couple of interesting photos. We've got uh, the crosses, um, the thin arm uh, Balkan Kreutz, the later type, which you can clearly see there, pointed out. Uh, and it says that uh, note that top wing crosses remain in the interim post April fat arm style. In other words, the black, the black part of the cross is fat, and the cables visible on the top wing were lifted, were for lifting the aircraft with a crane. Okay, these cables here, talking about just there. And it says, note the darker repainted area on the side of the fuselage below the observer's cockpit. Yeah, darker here. And then another one that's unidentified, it says, darker paint has been used to tidy up the post arm thin. Okay, yeah, you can see that these crosses are now much thinner than the earlier ones are. Very thick here, much thinner there. Um... Yeah, and it's talking about the parabellum uh, for the observer here. Note the black floats, the OG gun sight fitted to the observer's parabellum machine gun and the small bar fitted to the rear of the top wing cutout. Yes, here. And obviously launching this off. It says here, set adrift to go on patrol. Note how the painted hexagon camouflage appears darker on the wings and elevators compared to the two aircraft above in the photos above. So they obviously varied quite a bit, didn't they, look, in the appearance. Now that's not a lighting thing because it's in pretty much the same, face the same position. And the angle looks the same. It's on the slipway, so yeah, I'm guessing they're taken around at the same time. So there you go variation in colours, so don't get too hung up about your colours folks. Uh, and then we've got this, um, uh, another one that's from mid-1918 here, that's Silt. Photo below, uh, showing it in flight with the original Eisenkreutz Kreutz markings, I'll get it right eventually. Uh, Eisenkreutz, which is the, you know, the Norman Star Crosses. Um, and it says here again, noticing the how a change in lighting conditions between the two photos completely changes the appearance of the hexagonal camouflage, which it does. Now here we have an interesting picture. So this is mid-July uh, mid 20, 20, 
1918 at Sea Flug Station List, Westerland, on the island of Silt, the most northern region in Germany. This is quite near to Denmark, of course. Note the post-1918 thin arm Balkan Kreutz and the small windscreen fitted in front for the Observer. Oh yes, so now the Observer has also got a windscreen. Okay. And then another one, this is the one at Norderney, July 1918. Uh, and there are differences in these as well. If you look at the way that the uh, appearance... It doesn't show you underneath it for some reason, but because it's got the very thin... The Balkan Kreutz, very thin style here. It says the converted Balkan Kreutz and bitumous tar base paint covered floats seen in this picture. Note the small flare rack to the rear of the observer's cockpit. It's time now, just zoom you in for this. You're going to need it. <laughs> it's just talking about here. If you can make that out. There's a little rack of flares. And then over here we've got one that's actually on the water, as you can see. And it says, uh, converted Balkan Kreutz, looks like they've hand painted these. Uh, and the open pilot's cockpit door is visible with short oh, shorter exhausts, okay. And the unidentified crewman is standing on the starboard float. Ooh. Look at the photographs, they're amazing, aren't they? They really are good. And then here we go, um, it's on a Zeebrugge, it's got this rather nice, very Germanic looking, looks like a peacock head, like a crest. Um, it says, the identity of the crew is not known on that one. Very attractive looking thing. And look at here, some of the equipment that would be carried uh, on German Navy aircraft in the Great War. Look at that, that's impressive. So we've got We've got bombs, lots of bombs or bomblets. We've got fuel, we've got oil, fuel again. Uh, oh, sorry, oil here, this will be fuel cans. Then we've got all sorts of tools. We've got like a hammer, a uh, camera, uh, flare pistols, anemometer to measure the wind speed. Um, there's all sorts. I'm trying to figure out what they all are. There's also lights, compass. Flares, binoculars, so many items, it's amazing. Quite rope. <laughs> I mean, it's not, that, not really a lot of equipment, is it, we're going to see. And then there's a final shot here. So this is at Westerland at Silt, Northern Germany again. And it's got the later, very thin Balkan Kreutz um, and the darker wing struts. And they're having a bit of a parade. Well, it's actually a funeral. It looks like it's, um, look closely, it's clearly a funeral because they've got a coffin that's draped with the German flag there. Uh, I think there may be one, possibly two. So obviously it's one of their one of their local heroes that's obviously been shot down. And there we have it. Uh, and of course, I, so, I should, sorry, I shouldn't skip over the the end of these because uh, this is where they give credit very very rightly give credit to their team at Wingnut Wings, sadly no longer employed by that company. Um, and it goes into the detail about, you know, the guy that did the box art and the 3D modelling and the profile art and Richard Alexander, his project coordinator, he's quite well known in fact. Um, yeah. And sadly, of course, no longer in business, this company. Um, so, if you want to get your hat, I mean, that's just fantastic again, you know, it's the detail that they're going to, isn't it? You know, it gives you all the angles and lots and lots of data about how to go about assembling it, what it should look like, what the colours should be, etc. Not much else to say really. Beautiful. Now, let's look at the plastic as best we can. As I said, I'm not going to open any bags because these are worth a small fortune now. Um, but we will have a look anyway. We've got here your clear parts. And we've got these various windows that we just talked about. So you've got the I know what they are now. So this is the pilot's window here. And then you've got the, um, the windows at the side. There's a floor window, window into the, from the observer into the, through the bulkhead to the pilot. Then the, they both have a floor, uh, side window I should say. I think the observer has one on each side and he has one 
No, that's wrong. He has a, it, sorry, the observer has a window to the front through to the pilot and then he has a floor window as well. And then the pilot has a floor window here and then I think he has um, possibly a side window also. And these little interesting little windscreens at the front just above the, uh, like an aero windscreen really aren't they? Uh, one for the pilot, one for the observer. Very nice, beautiful. Well, then we have got our engine sprue here. Let's go back a bit. Sorry about the reflections. I'm going to kill some of the lighting because it does make it better if we have less light, actually. There we go. Um, so, what have we got? Our propellers. Three choices here. Uh, quite a thin one, uh, thin and short with a square tip there. Longer and more sort of fluted style, perhaps a bit more, a little bit, probably a bit quieter. And then there's like an interim one with a big boss in the centre. And then we've got our uh, Benz engine here, six cylinder engine, with all its uh, cylinders visible. And a bit closer for you, there we go. And then we've got the various components here. We've got uh, parabellum bullets in the background here. Just on my thumb. There's on this side. We've got the back, the back side. We've got some springs here. That shows some suspension springs. Um, it's like it's like a leaf springs, in fact, aren't they? Leaf springs. And here you can see your parabellum. Uh, and your spandau machine gun and the bullets. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we've got the um, traditional wing nut wings, ubiquitous uh, parabellum sprue, which of course has all its machine gun uh, parts on it. And obviously this one that's just like a, a basic barrel is the one where you, you build it up using the photo etch around the outside. Uh, so we've got LMG14 and you've got the you've got it with yeah, the basic version and the one that's the sort of simple one where you don't have to make it up, it's already got the a cooling jacket on it. And then we have all the other various components. So um, for various other variants of the Parabellum and the uh, ammunition magazines here as well, rotary magazines, beautiful. You know, I mean, look at them. There's no, you know, there's no splash or there's no faults. And but the, I think we should just remember something here. Wing at wings had the actual injection molding was created for them in China. A, a number of suppliers, as I understand it. But they exerted on those suppliers the very highest standards, which of course when Meng took on the Fokker triplane, they did not do. I believe that the same situation occurred. I don't believe that triplane was, for a second, actually produced in Meng's own normal injection moulding factory. I'm convinced of it, because it's nothing like their normal quality. Meng produced some great kits. This was not one of them, I'm afraid, so any of you that have tried to build it will know what I mean. Anyway, here we've got a big old screw. So we've got these very unusual elevators here. Oops, can't get you in. Try to bring you in a bit closer. There we go. I mentioned about the slightly odd uh, shape of these elevators at the back, how they were almost bird feather like. You can see it here, can't you? Very, very curious the setup that is. Don't really. Um, yeah, it's a very, very strange design compared to even things, uh, you know, contemporary aircraft of the day. Anyway, there we've got the nice padded seat for the pilot. Uh, here is the back of the seat where my thumb is here. And then of course you've got your various um, sides of the cockpit framework here. And we have got the exhaust, a very curiously designed car style exhaust, uh, which is actually that way up as you, you know, it comes out of the cylinders here, 
into one manifold chimney here that goes over the top. Uh, and then we've got various other small components including the steering wheel here. Um, and again, you know, there's no flash on these, they're all beautiful. Got some ailerons here. Which is very nice. Same on the other side. There. Very, very nice indeed. Uh, now we've got this very big, unusual sort of style of tailplane, which reminds me of the, um, is it the Janine Staltau? The, uh, the, the bird-like, pterodactyl-looking style of tail. <laughs> uh, and then on, on this, interestingly on this aircraft, you've got these uh, options for having your parabellum. Actually, here's the two different options for um, port side and starboard side where you can see clearly the differences here with the, uh, the different styles of the basic style. This one is the one, the more detailed one, where you build it up with the, again, with the uh, cooling shroud made up of the photo etch that's included in the kit. Or you can have this simple one where it's done for you and perhaps just do a bit of weathering up. And the same on the other side. Here's the uh, curiously designed, and yes, this is the right way up, uh, the rudder, which as you can see is uh, yeah, an unusual design, to put it mildly. And then we've got various parts like the instrument panel here. And I think we've got the, uh, the radiator, radiator here. So it's that way up in fact. Well, almost like a car radiator at the front of the, the aircraft. Really nice. I mean, you know, yes. It's a pleasure to have these parts in your hand, really, even though I, uh, even though in this case I'm actually separated from the parts, being in my hand by some gloves and some <laughs> cellophane as well. But that's the name of the game with these, because uh, it's quite a desirable kit, this one. Um, and these seaplanes are so nice, aren't they? I mean, look at this. So we've got a sprue here with the actual uh, fuselage sides and the, uh, the top section of the wing. What we've got is, he says, trying to zoom it the wrong way, <laughs> after practice. Look at this, you can see the, uh, the cooling vents here for the engine, and the engine goes, head of the pilot. Yep, it's cooling vents, and we've got the pilot's area with the pilot's door here. This is the observer's position. Um, very nicely surfaced this, I've got to say. I'm not sure if that's coming out on the camera or not. Uh, and then you've got the top of the wing section here. Oops, trying to get the reflections. Get back a bit. There we go. Yeah, that's really nice. You've got all the fine rib detail in there. Okay, and then we have got whoops, the wings. Now, there's obviously more wings on this kit than there were on the W29. Um, yeah, and they are meeting. Of course, they're a complete full wing, these. They're not in halves. It's not top and bottom. That's the entire wing. So you've got this beautiful sort of aero section. You can just about make it out there. And then you've got this lovely ribbing detail as well. Very, very nice uh, finish, beautiful satiny plastic. Uh, this one has got a access hatch in it. I'm not sure what that's for actually. I can't recall seeing that on another World War One. It almost looks like a fuel uh, cap, but I'm sure it isn't. I don't think they fuel it through the wings, not on these. Um, perhaps somebody will shout up and tell me. And then we've got the, uh, what I think is the so they're the lower wing, I think, and this is the upper wing that's going to have the ailerons on it. That's why it's got this cut out here for that central section we just saw. It's beautiful. Perfect moulding. No warpage in this. That's as flat as a paper, I can assure you. There's no... Zoom you back. 
there's all this Meng silliness where it's all warped and you've got to fight it and try and force it, manipulate it using boiling water or heat guns and all that stuff. It's just perfect. It's not warped at all. You hold that up, it's completely perfect. As it should be. And then finally, last but not least, we've got the floats, which are really meaty. I've got to say, look at these. What monstrous floats these are. Wow. Look at that. So you've got some real depth to them. So this is the bottom of the float here. That's the front. We're coming back towards the rear. And obviously that is the top, front, moving back to the rear. Really nice, and you've got these really meaty, huge, great struts, which really are part of the features of the aircraft. They're very meaty, and this is why they totally need very minimal rigging on this aircraft, because the struts are so strong. Uh, they've got cabane struts, don't they? These big ones. Um, there we have it. That's kind of, um, that's the kit really. I have to say that, uh, well what can I say, I think you know what's coming next. <laughs> we have got, and look at that, you see how I managed to pack the, back, the box again without you even noticing, I did it by magic. <laughs> so, a truly beautiful kit. Um, very historic sort of building experience you'll have with that as well I'm sure. Um, what is there not to like? 10 out of 10, no question. You know, we need other manufacturers, please, to stop saying, oh, we don't, don't exist anymore, so we don't need to bother. That seems to be the attitude, and I don't agree with that at all. I think that they have shown what can be done, and they didn't charge stupid prices. Okay, now, yes, they're stupid now, of course, because they're so desirable and no longer in production. But they were stupid prices, they were very competitive. They were 70 pounds in the UK, thereabouts, for one of these. So, frankly, um, why can other manufacturers not step up to that standard? And I mean everybody, really. Um, Tamiara Close. Um, recently we had this uh, Edouard Tora 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 uh, A6M0 set, which actually went a little bit closer than they've been, anyway. Um, and, of course, they're very good because they include things like stencils in uh, masks, I should say. Mask sets, um, in their, especially in their limited edition kit. And a bit of photo etch and all that kind of thing. <coughs> But I think we need to see a little bit better. I mean, again, the packaging of this kit, they're always perfect. It fits the box perfectly. There's no, you know, there's hardly, hardly any movement there at all. Whereas you get modern Airfix and you get this massive box with a kit that's this big, totally unconnected. You can see that the people who are producing the sprues are not talking to the people making the boxes. It doesn't make any sense. We just want, you know, it's not asking for that much. I'm sorry it isn't. This gets 10 out of 10 and is fully worthy of it. Other kits would get 10 out of 10, I've seen recently, based on the injection moulding, but they just can't be bothered with the instructions or the data or the historic sides to it. These guys were knocking this out for £70. That was no dearer than the sort of excuse of an experience, you know, a kit that's now more than that. Prices have gone up, I know. But, but let's just, just let's go back to when this was a current. It was no dearer than anybody else's kits and it was dramatically better. The quality standard was better, the presentation was better, everything was better. There's no reason why others shouldn't be aiming to do that too. So I would just appeal to the other manufacturers, please, try and up your game a little bit. Especially I'm talking to Revell, Airfix and the Chinese manufacturers annoy me intensely. Because they are so good at the injection moulding. Some of them recently, we've had the Lancaster bomber and we've had um, uh, the border models, Messerschmitt 109, and so many others in 2021. A year we're at the end of now. Uh, and they produce beautiful kits, but they just can't be bothered with the instructions or the decals or the data. They just can't be bothered to do those properly. Well, they need to because they're charging a lot of money. They're not cheap, these kits and others have proven it can be done for the price. It can be done, so please, let's get let's get the standard raised. Anyway, enough from me. I uh, hope you'll give me 10 out of 10 to match the kit. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you didn't find it too dull. Um, it's a nice kit, that, and it deserves a bit of time, especially those instructions. It's a joy to go through it. I, I, you know, you learn something. It's, it's wonderful. 
thanks a lot for being along for the ride hope you enjoyed the show we'll have something else coming up soon which will be of interest I'm sure in the meantime thank you very much for joining me in all your time and take care of yourselves thanks a lot and bye for now <laughs>